Hi, this is Kendrick with worldmedicalschool.org. We're going to talk about acute lymphoblastic leukemia. So this is a fairly uncommon disease in, uh, in uh, relation to the other diseases we've talked about recently, but it still uh, is uh, one of the most common killers of children. It's the, the most common cause of natural death in children after... Um, after perinatal complications and uh, congenital abnormalities. So it's still a really big deal. We are getting better at treating it. We've got an 80 to 85 percent five-year survival rate, but of course we'd like to get that down, uh, get it up to, you know, 90 to 100 percent. So what happens here is, of course, we get cells that are multiplying without control. So that's caused by some kind of mutation in the cell, in the DNA, that turns off the regulation processes. And a lot of times this is set off by radiation or, or some kind of chemical, but um, but also a lot of these just uh, pro pop up uh, spontaneously. So the cells that are growing out of control are uh, the lymphoblasts. So you can tell in this picture that these are lymphoblasts and not lymphocytes because they're bigger and you can see a little bit more cytoplasm. So these lymphoblasts are crowding out all the healthy cells. Uh, so this is happening in the bone marrow um, and it happens in the peripheral blood as well. But the bone marrow is where we get a lot of our uh, uh, presenting symptoms like bone pain. So if you have a, a periosteal proliferation of, of uh, lymphoblasts, then first of all, you get crowding, but you also get uh, areas where there is necrosis, and uh, some of that is where, where you get the bone pain. So around a third of these kids have uh, some kind of pain. The younger kids won't know what to say about it, but they, they might present with a limp and uh, lymphadenopathy is found in about half these patients and headache and other neurological problems comes in about uh, five percent so fever and bleeding are also things to wa watch out for testicular enlargement is a little bit less common but still happens mediastinal mass and then almost all of these have uh, an anemia or thrombocytopenia and this is do in part to what we were talking about, crowding out the normal healthy cells so you don't get the thrombocytes forming, you don't get the red blood cells forming as well. So in your differential diagnosis, of course, if we're talking about fever, uh, then there's lots of things that are on our list, or fever and lymphadenopathy, you know, any infection can cause those things. Um, but these are persisting for a long, longer time than, for example, just a normal viral infection. So Epstein-Barr uh, and pertussis are examples of infections that, that can last over a longer time and may look a little bit like this. But with any, uh, with any fever and lymphadenopathy, you want to make sure that it's clearing up. So uh, juvenile idiopathic arthritis is on the list because uh, the bone pain might be close to the joints and so it'll look like a joint pain. Uh, idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura is on the list because uh, even though I didn't men it, men it, men it, mention this in the presentation, they also can have petechiae. And since we, we, these kids are anemic, then uh, all anemias uh, need to be ruled out. If we, if we don't rule uh, ALL in right away, um, but especially aplastic anemia because of the thrombocytopenia that you see here too. Smith disease, I'd never heard of this before, and there's not an up-to-date article on it or a YouTube page, or a, sorry, a Wikipedia page about it, um, but it's called Smith disease. You can look it up on uh, rightdiagnosis.com. They have a little blurb about it, uh, but I don't know much about it. Um, other malignancies are, of course, on the list, especially these ones that can affect the bone, like neuroblastoma, retinoblastoma, rhabdomyosarcoma, and Ewing sarcoma. But uh, then on our list, uh, as well as are any other malignancy, because all of them can cause uh, 
changes in in uh, blood counts, and they can also cause fever. So uh, we need to rule out all malignancies and hyperiosinic uh, syndromes as well. So diagnosis is going to happen, of course, first in the primary care clinic where you uh, start picking up these symptoms and you might run some blood tests uh, like uh, a complete blood count with uh, with differential and, and with a peripheral smear maybe if, if this is on your list of things you're looking for. But once you suspect uh, some kind of cancer, of course, refer them to the pediatric cancer centers where they'll get bone marrow biopsies. Uh, if uh, CNS involvement is suspected, then you do CSF cytology. And if the bone marrow contains more than 25% lymph- lymphoblasts, then we call it a uh, lympho- uh, lymphoblastic uh, leukemia. But uh, lymphoma is essentially the same thing. I mean, there we have uh, proliferation of lymphocytes, but they are just in a in a ball somewhere, and they're not going to be as vol- involved in much in the blood or in the bone marrow. But it's basically the same disease, and we'll talk about that in a second. So th- they're also going to be screened for other complications. If you have a lot of these, uh, a lot of these cells dying, then you get uh, uric acid nephropathy um, and other complications of, of uric acid in the blood. And of course, they'll be tested for their viral titers like EBV, CMV, HIV, etc., cetera, uh, because they're in an immunocompromised state or will be soon under treatment. And we've talked for a long time about uh, the, the FAB classification. This is the French, American, British classification, and it's pretty simple. Uh, so it's probably the one that uh, will still be tested on in the in the short term. But there's a lot of suggestion that we we may ad- abandon it altogether at some point. So the L1 classification has the small uniform cells, L2 the large varied cells, and the L3 large varied cells with vacuoles, the bubble-like. But the World Health Organization uh, recently met um, and talked about a completely different classification because they say that this uh, FAB classification doesn't really mean anything to us in terms of prognostic factors or it doesn't change treatment at all. So uh, they have these, uh, these three major categories of classification. The first one is essentially a combination of FAB, L1, and L2. But they break it out into these cytogenetic subtypes. Um, You'll see on this list, uh, for example, you have the uh, Philadelphia chromosome and uh, other mutations that might be involved here. So, and those mutations are really going to be what's going to tell us what the prognosis is and how we want to treat these things. Um... These, these could be B cell precursors or T cell precursors. The T cell ones are a little bit, uh, are associated with a poor prognosis and are usually treated uh, more aggressively. The old FAB3 L3 uh, classification is just the Burkitt's lymphoma type or leukemia type. And then 3 is by phenotypic acute leukemia. So how do we treat this? Chemotherapy is the major uh, treatment, and we talk about it in three stages. One is remission induction. This is where we are trying to just uh, beat down these cells until they're less than 5% of bone marrow mass, um, or 5% of bone marrow cells. So we do that with steroids like prednisolone or dexamethasone. Uh, Vincristine we'll see in all these phases here, and asparaginase. Um, in the con- consolidation intensification phase, that's where we are basically just trying to wipe it out the rest of the way. So vincristine, cyclo- cyclophosphamide, cytarabine, these are kind of our harsher, uh, our harsher chemotherapy drugs. And then for maintenance, we use uh, mercaptopurine, 
uh, that's on a daily basis, methotrexate on a weekly basis, and then a course of vincristine uh, five days out of each month. Um, radiation is still uh, part of therapy, but less than it was before. We used to use radiation as a, a CNS prophylaxis. We'd do uh, radiation of the head to try and uh, keep um, masses from growing in the in the uh, cranial cavity. But we've we've stopped doing that just because it has uh, a lot of complications with it, and it's not any more effective than uh, chemotherapy is. So intrathecal chemotherapy has mostly replaced radiation. And uh, you start this uh, CNS prophylaxis in the remission phase. Other sources have said do it during the consolidation phase. I'm not sure which one's right. but uh, So you can use this to help prevent uh, CNS complications. So thanks for uh, Vashi Dansk. Uh, for uh, providing our picture for today. And if you want to volunteer, the best thing you can do is to write a practice question that has to do with the content today. So write that question, post it in the comments, and uh, we'll be able to share that with other people who are watching the video. And that would be a very helpful part of this process. If you have comments about the video, anything that we got wrong or should do better in the future, please let us know. Uh, please share the link with other people, and uh, if you want to get involved more, go to worldmedicalschool.org backslash volunteer.